My name is Tindi, a service director at the University of Technology Department of Teaching Learning Methods Unit. And this beautiful morning, I would want to share with you some insights as pertains to the fundamentals of teaching in higher education. Of course, whether you are new to university teaching or whether it's just accumulation of your continued wealth of experience in teaching, this will be a wonderful session for you. And so uh, this beautiful morning, I would want to let you know that as you go to teach in the university, you got to think about leveraging on the strategic foundation of the university you're going to teach at. It's very important to consider its mission, vision, core values, and graduate attributes uh, within the university that you'll be working with. It's also very important, ladies and gentlemen, that you are aware and you are capable of mapping them, mapping your strategic intentions as well as your graduate attributes, program project or the program learning outcomes, as well as subject or course learning outcomes. That will be very beautiful if you wired them in your lecture plan so that you have a wonderful blueprint that will guide your teaching in the whole of the semester. It's very, very, very important, ladies and gentlemen, that we go deep into what we're going to look at. And I wanted to ask you what was or rather, who was your best teacher and how did he or she inspire your teaching of course you must be aware that great teachers are great innovators we don't forget about them and so a teacher affects eternity he can never know where his influence will stop and that is why i would want with great love and respect to rem to remind you to be great teachers because you do not know where your influence stops you can only remember your good teachers, I suppose, or the extremely uh, average ones. Now, when you go to teaching, you've got to remember that teaching is like fishing. When you go fishing, we use different lures for different kinds of fish. We use different methods for different learners, you know, in, well in class. It's also worth noting, to use uh, some allegory here, that teaching is like a beautiful music. When you play it alone, it makes some sound well, but when you play it together, it makes good tune, rhythm, and they become an amazing music. So what is effective teaching? Effective teaching refers to the extent to which, as a teacher, you employ those learning outcomes successfully to bring about the intended outcomes for the program of study. Now, are teachers born or made? Well, there are allegories that say that teachers are born, and that, is, that means that naturally when you look at your lineage, your great-grandfather was a good teacher, your father was a good teacher, and so you're a teacher by, you know, by birth. And yet, when you talk about teachers being bad, we are saying that maybe you go to school of education and study teaching. And probably this is why I am here with this lecture, that in this university and, in like, and, like, and many other universities, we have wonderful uh, uh, professionals, engineers, doctors, medics, but they're not teachers. And this program that I'm running here right now will help equip you with the basic fundamental tenets that govern the, 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 the teaching learning process. Now, the best teacher, of course, is he or she who has gone to school of education and uh, equipped himself or herself with the basics of teaching. Now, I want to take you through the seven principles of good teaching. When you walk into class, what are those fundamental principles that will guide, uh, guide your teaching? Now, how was school today? If you ask a child, they may say just too much information. That would mean a lot of, we bomb them with information, but we do not allow teaching to occur. The first principle is that good practice should encourage student-faculty contact. We therefore should try and ensure that we are available for these learners ensure that you create time so that they, are, they can off time, off office, and probably within a lecture, plan, lecture, lecture time, to allow them to consult you as much as possible. Technology, therefore, should not uh, uh, account for your absence in class. Principle number two, there should be cooperation among students and between learners. It's very important that as lecturers or as teachers, we allow learners to learn from within themselves and from the learning community. Actually, number three says that we should encourage active learning and avoid death by PowerPoints. There are so many good lecturers who know their staff, but when they walk into class, they turn their backs to, or their faces to the, against the learners, turn to the board, calculate the mathematics, but they do not encourage face touch, face contact with the learners. Now that is very, very dangerous. It's also very important 
that as you go with the slides, as you go with the PowerPoint slides, make good use of the slides. Do not flip through very fast, maybe 60 slides in one hour, and that is flipping through and learners have not gained much out of the class. Principle number four says that there should be prompt feedback. As you teach, it's worth noting that feedback is very important. If you could give them feedback as and when it is due, it will help them inform their preparation for subsequent lectures. It will also inform you on how they are faring in teaching learning. Also, emphasize time on task. Do not allow learning and teaching to go on for the whole year without giving timelines. It's very, very important as teachers that we create timelines upon which uh, assessment tasks will be conducted, upon which we shall collect the uh, assignments, upon which we shall return the marked scripts. Actually, on your engagement contract with the students, which is your lecture plan, you should clearly delineate the timelines upon which these activities will be conducted. I also wanted to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that it's also very important as a sixth principle to communicate very high expectations to your learners. Now, this does not mean that you should uh, elevate learning so very much and, you know, from abstract to, to, to concrete. I'm still just trying to say that ensure the learners do know that you expect the very best out of them. It's very, very important that as we engage in the teaching learning process, we allow learners to stretch their potentials because it is possible, it's doable, they can make it, but also with the right uh, environment and encouragement. The last principle says that you should respect diverse talents and ways of learning. Of course, you know, our learners are very, very gifted. And we want to believe that there are variations. We got average students, and we may also have exceptional students, those gifted students. So I wanted to encourage you, my fine colleagues, that as you go to class, you ensure you appreciate diversity in, in ways of learning. There are those visual learners who learn by seeing. There are audio learners who learn by hearing. There are audio visual learners who learn by seeing and hearing, and etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But let's take good care of them. Now. Of course, a mediocre teacher tells it, a good teacher explains, a superior teacher demonstrates, but a great teacher inspires. How I wish that we can become great teachers who inspire. Of course, that is Chinese philosophy. So, what are some of the core qualities of a good teacher? Well, a good teacher must have superb knowledge of the subject matter he or she is dispensing. It will be really fulfilling if you are in command, in great control of what you are uh, you know, teaching. Know your staff, know whom you are staffing, know when, you are, when they are staffed, and eventually get into your subject. Get the subject into you. Get the subject into the hearts of the learners. Knowledge of your subject is very important, of course. You can't give what you don't have. So I want to encourage you to be so very much calibrated about knowing your content. Number two, communication. Now, it's very, very important that you also are able to give to the learners what you know, what you have. Now, even if you know it so much like a god and you can't give it to the learners, then you do not know it at all. So it's very, very important that you are able to remember that learners learn much more about, learners learn how. The how helps them understand what you are saying. So what the teacher is, is more important at times than even what he or she teaches. So be energetic, be able to communicate your learner, uh, communicate your content to the learners. A good teacher has the ability to communicate their knowledge and expertise to these learners. The third principle will be uh, will interest. It's very, very important that you show enthusiasm, that contagious enthusiasm around the content of your uh, dispensation. It will be very healthy for a teacher to ensure that his class is interesting or her class is interesting. Support what you say with examples, statistics, definitions, and testimonies. It is the supreme art of a teacher to awaken creative, creative joy in the expression of knowledge with the learners. So do not go to class and look like you are dead, waiting, burial. Look interested, look enthusiastic, be contagious about you know, learning. The third the fourth one will be respect. Now, th this is two-way traffic. Respect is earned. Respect is never given. A good teacher must have a deep-seated concern and respect for the students he or she is teaching. Common sense will tell you what to ignore, but ensure that you assess the situation quickly, make appropriate decision, know what to ignore, and of course, be proactive. Remember, if you don't respect the learners, 
Men, the learners will not respect you, and yet we'd want them to, you know, respect us. So, what does the literature say about good teachers? Like I've said, this is just a summary. Knowledge about your subject is supreme. Adopt and organize your systematic approach to your teaching. Be very, very enthusiastic and interesting. Respect the students and have very high expectations of, of you know, of their performance. Now, uh, this takes me now to the praxis of teaching. Now that we have set the baselines, you go to class to teach, what should you do first? Set induction. This is about creating the right atmosphere upon which learning can take place. Ensure you create the right environment, the right atmosphere. Don't walk into class and, you know, uh, ridicule a learner or go into class and bash a learner. This will in to this, will, this will create a very toxic environment that discourages learning. So set induction, probably then introduce the topic. Introduce, introduction of the topic can be done in so many ways. Maybe you can give an allegory, allegory or an anecdote that relates to the topic that you're going to talk about this day. Maybe you can uh, show a movie, a, sh a short clip about a topic that you're going to talk about. Could be you can ask them questions on their previous knowledge uh, situation on the topic of, uh, of the day. Then go ahead and talk about the topic. Now then, the, th the third step will be topic mastication. This is where you go and demystify the topic, break down the topic and explain uh, you know, what you're about to cover on this day. This is what we call topic mastication. You're achieving the topic. The fourth uh, aspect will be reinforcing or stimulating the topic. Now, this is where you go around and get exemplifications. You give models, you give illustrations to cement or, uh, you know, add, add, add strength or strengthen what you are talking about. Then ultimately, do not go get, get out of class without summarizing. Now, this because hard data seem to suggest that students are always with us at the beginning and or at the end of the lecture. So, those who come back from mental exile towards the end of the lecture will be privileged to benefit from your summary. So please do not finish your class without summarizing. Now, there are so many teaching methods. I don't know which one is best for you, but they are all circumstantial. We have lectures, seminar, problem-based learning, project-based learning, group discussions, role play, workshops, etc., etc. But pick the best one depending on what you want to teach and of course the learning outcomes you would want to uh, pick otherwise i am here to say that i hear and i forget i see and i remember and do and i learn this is chinese philosophy this talks about or guides us into what is called learner-centered pedagogy. This is a very innovative method of teaching where the learner is at the center of learning. We are saying do not substitute active learning projects and experiences for the lectures. Hold students responsible for materials yet to be covered. Ensure that you assign open-ended questions and problems. Use simulations and role play. Use self-paced and or cooperative learning. It's very very, very important, dear colleagues, that we are aware of this flipped curriculum or tilted pedagogy so that we can allow learner to be at the center of learning. We are all co-creators of knowledge. Let's not go into class and think about the sage on stage as opposed to, you know, the, the novice at the periphery or at, at, at the fringe. And that, this is very, very important. Moving forward, pedagogy today is focused on the learners. And so at the, best, at the end of the day, we got to think about flipping the curriculum. Think about putting the learner at the center of whatever is going on in class. It's possible, it's doable. Look at those competences that they will stand to you know, harness if you put them in the, in the, in the, at the center of learning. Think about the competencies. Think about the learning objectives. Think about the learning activities at the base of the pyramid so that as you move towards the zenith, you really realize the program, uh, project outcomes and the program outcomes. Now, it's how long should a faculty spend in class? This is subject to adoption. However, I would strongly still encourage uh, from literature that uh, lit uh, faculty should spend about 60% in class lecturing. And then you can spend 10% on student independent work, that the students working in isolation, in, in silos. Then you can have 15% students working in groups so that they will have cooperative learning benefits. And then 15% can be uh, done 
uh, used on others. This is on lecture time. Of course, when you're doing tutorials, that will be a different story because then they will take uh, much, much of the time. Maybe flip it to 60. Uh, I, I want to encourage you, colleagues, that it's very, very important that we continue thinking about tips for good teaching. Now, research seems to suggest that you need to have active movement. Do not go to class and stand stiff on a, on a very stiff posture as though you are, you know, you, you are scared. Active movement is very important for you as a lecturer in class. It's very, very important that when you go to class, you move, make good use of the, you know, class. Again, when you move, move into the rows, move through the columns, and then show you both the back row and on the front, and let the learners feel on board. On board the learners through movement. Again, good eye contact. It's very, very important that you keep your eyes focused on the learners. Do not, and I repeat, do not give the learners your back because then they move easily into, they gravitate easily into mental exile. So keep good eye contact. It also helps them build confidence and self-esteem. Again, I also talk about good posture. As you go to class to teach, do not take those awkward postures that seem to steal away your confidence levels, that seem to, you know, distort your voice quality, that seem to uh, suggest that probably you're not in control. So allow your shoulders to be in the right posture so that your voice quality is really not hampered with. Again, encouraging gestures. When you go to class to teach, uh, try and use uh, your hands. Swing your hands, swipe them, move them, because this encourages uh, learners to keep in touch with you. Unlike a scenario where the, learner, the lecturer is standing stiff like a scarecrow, that is not the picture we would want to have in classes. So have hands, use your hands, let your facial expressions say something about what you are doing. Be involved. Let us hear the tonal variations. Let us see your body language encouraging, inviting us to onboard your teaching. As a good teacher also, you may need to have, or you don't may, you may not may, you really need to have impressive diction. Now, irrespective of the language of instruction in your university of teaching, you must ensure that your diction is excellent, above average. Now, for example, in our University of Technology here, our, our language of instruction is purely English. And so we would expect you to be on top of your game with English language, irrespective of your background, your, your first language or where you went to school. Now that you have signed up with the University of Technology to teach our students and to teach them in English, you must ensure you do an extra work and ensure that you can explicitly speak and express yourself in good English. Now, we are aware, of course, that the choice, the first language may affect your ability to pronounce certain words uh, and or, you know, the way you, you speak certain uh, languages. So maybe, for example, you want to pronounce uh, S and then you end up having SH, you slur a bit, or you probably want to pronounce R and, and then you find yourself pronouncing L. And this may be a factor, but Still, ensure you are on top of your game with the addiction. Of course, then look good, visually good. Take good care of yourself, dress well. Of course, this is bas basic. Even though I know our salaries are modest as teachers world over, ensure still you are able to buy and put on good clothes, well, uh, you know, washed and probably ironed. It's also very, very important. They'll get nice uh, shoes. You also <laughs> uh, get a nice belt because when you walk into class, it is the case that learners tend to look at your, uh, your, your belt. You, you, you know, they're seated down so they'll be seeing your belt. So ensure you don't get the handle of a handbag and wrap it around your waist, uh, you know, because you don't have a belt. That will be very, very embarrassing. So these are some of the good tips that, that we can share with you when you want to, you know, up your game when it comes to teaching learning. Now, there are, then there are the professional ethics that govern our trade, a bit, just a bit of them. Of course, you must ensure you have your course file. Within your course file, we'll expect that you have within national qualification framework. You must carry with you therein graduate attributes, list them therein, have course learning outcomes clearly stipulated, have your schemes of work, have your lesson plans, have your lecture notes or resources that you're going to use for teaching, maybe in soft copy, maybe in hard copy, H have samples of your assessment tasks, have your rubrics that you use for marking these assessment tasks, ECTs. So ensure you have your course file. 
also ensure you really love your job. Be assiduous. If you go to class and, you know, professional ethics would want us not to talk negatively against the institution where we teach. Don't walk into class and start talking negatively about the university where you teach, where these students learn. You know, you're really killing their pride and passion about their university of choice. Also, ensure you dress well. I've talked about this. Have good grooming. Professors would want to wear beards. I know some of you would want to wear beards, but still keep them well trimmed so that as you speak, we don't see accumulate, accumulation of saliva around your, your mouth. It becomes, you know, awkward and makes learning teaching process uh, a bit awkward. Also ensure you be open-minded. You're going to teach learners who have had interaction with the technology. Some of them have, uh, have really read a lot ahead, uh, you know, on the topic of your interest. But so be open-minded, you know, we are hardwired to continuous learning. And I expect you as a, a good lecturer to be open-minded and do not think you are the alpha and omega of knowledge. I said the greatest learner in the teaching learning process is the teacher. Because to teach is to learn twice. Please allow the learners to challenge you. Of course, positive criticism is very, very healthy and, you know, constructive. Again, punctuality. Today we have learners, uh, lecturers, who are, I call them, helicopter consultant lecturers. Always on, you know, consulting for all the agencies in town. They do not find time for our students. If you have signed up as a lecturer or as a teacher, ensure you create not only office time when you are not in class, but also be available in class, attend classes. Now, technology or blended learning or use of learning management systems should not, or artificial intelligence, should not substitute for your presence in class. Ensure you are still in class as and at when necessary. But also, apart from this, create timelines, it could be on WhatsApp, maybe on social media, maybe on email, so that you can have uh, virtual, uh, you know, real-time, uh, you know, meetings with your students off, 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 off class hours. So please be available and be punctual. If the class is starting at 10, be there at 10. I also wanted to, of course, this is basic, this is very basic, healthy relationship with your students. Do not let the handshake pass below the elbow. So please, I may not expound on that very well, but you definitely know the learners are looking up to you uh, as, as a pillar of moral compass. So please, they trust you. Do not betray their trust. Have, be able to coach them, to counsel them, and to guide them as a parent would. Now, there should be integrity in assessment. This is the case. You must be able to be transparent with your assessment, show them the rubrics, and of course, give them the deadlines upon which they should return. Of course, I talked about this. Again, drug and substance abuse. As a lecturer in high institution, our rule, rules of engagement forbids us from smoking or taking drugs within the premises of our work. You may be uh, smoking or drinking, but please do it in a safe zones that are gazetted for, for that. So this is about professional ethics that govern our teaching in higher institutions. But also, we are thinking about well-informed lifelong learners. I say it again, please. In this era of technological revolution, we expect learners to be so very much informed of what we're going to cover with them. And so they, we must be willing and ready to face those challenges. Now, you also think about class control. And this is a very interesting topic for, I mean, for, for those who are going to teach for the first time. You, because of your body size, because of your morphological features, you may feel a bit disturbed when you walk into class. You may not be able to you know, the, control the students. But I'm here to say that the best way to control the students is by giving them a very good lecture. Now, when you're an authority in your field, the learners will respect you and would want to, you know, be very humble before you or be very proactive before you because you are an authority. We call it expert power. Once you've shown that you are an expert in your own jurisdiction of trade, they'll really respect you. So please apply psychology of learning. Be firm. Seek to understand more than to be understood. Of course, once might say, if you want to control your class, be very good. Be on top of your content. 
then the learners definitely will not be a problem. I also uh, must encourage teachers that today as we teach, we must think about the 21st century skills. This is the learning skills. Ensure you give them critical thinking skills, collaboration skills, communication skills, and creativity skills. They are not going to work in a global village. And we are thinking about wiring learners who are capable of working anywhere across the globe with people of diverse background. So you must ensure you teach them how to collaborate and how to be global citizens. Of course, literacy skills is, cannot be underrated at this time. Digital literacy is very, very important in this information age. The life skills also that accompany them must be very, very much emphasized. Teach them networking, emotional intelligence. Teach them how to be global citizens. Teach them how to never say die to learning. It's very, very important that the learners are wired in a way that they can survive beyond the content that we, we give them in class. So please be techno savvy, survive as you go to class. Uh, well, assessment and evaluation, I may not emphasize this so much, but it's very, very important that as a teacher, you think about assessment and evaluation. Now we have formative assessment and summative assessment. When you think about formative assessment, these are the assessment for learning. You do assessment as learning goes on. But when you talk about a, form a summative assessment, this is an assessment of learning. It happens when learning has taken place. Now, as, as lecturers, we are constantly involved in evaluation. But why must we do this? They help Im improve our, you know, improve, in provide information, best line for improvement. They help provide information to evaluate the course that we are teaching. Of course, it offers feedback to faculty. But also, we must encourage learners to participate, particularly here in Unitech, in the student online evaluation of teaching because we use those feedbacks when, 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 when providing uh, analysis for upskilling, when we are be benchmarking, uh, preparing content for our in-house capacity building initiatives, we use feedback from the students. But we also use students. So, dear lecturers, do not be afraid of students evaluating your teaching. Because when they do so, we also use those feedback, you know, when making promotion and tenure decisions, whether contract renewal, whether a prom uh, promotion, whether recommending you for further studies, you know, abroad, and, and stuff like that. <clears throat> but when you're doing assessment evaluation, please consider the breadth and the depth of the assessment. I also, in, in conclusion, would want to say that there are these concepts of, uh, uh, there's an allegory that says that I taught Stripe how to whistle. This Stripe is a dog. So I taught Stripe how to whistle. But then this my boy says, ah, I didn't hear him whistling though. You know, he goes to the dog and says, dog, please whistle. I didn't hear the dog whistle. Then I say, I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. Now, it's very, very important for you to note that we are here not to teach them but to ensure that they learn. And this is the bottom line, this is what defines you and me as academics, and if you can't define, if you can't ensure they learn, then you have really uh, done injustice to these students. Learning never ends. Anyone who stops learning is old, whether at 20 or at 80, anyone who keeps learning stays young. Effective teachers try and try and try and let students know that they try. Why? Because to teach is to learn twice. Uh, as I conclude, I want to uh, give you a summary, a recap of what we have covered. We have said that if you want to be an excellent teacher on top of your game, then you got to have knowledge of what you are teaching. Then number two, you must be able to transmit that knowledge to the learners. And again, number three, you must have interest, outstanding interest in what you are teaching. And finally, you must have a deep-seated respect for the students. I am saying that the greatest room in the world is the room for improvement. I hope I've been of service to you. Thank you so very much. I hope to see you again in a subsequent session. Thank you. <music>